Hello and welcome to the Ransomware Hostage Rescue Checklist, your step-by-step -step guide to preventing and surviving a ransomware attack. I love that title. Today's awesome webinar is sponsored by Know Before and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Jess Steinbach with Actual Tech Media and I am absolutely thrilled to be your moderator for this discussion. Today we are joined by an expert who really needs no introduction since most of us are really already raving fans. Roger Grimes, Data Driven and security evangelist at Know Before is here to guide us through this exciting checklist. And there is so much to cover here today. Honestly, I don't want to take a single minute away from the discussion. So I'm going to zip through a few of those important housekeeping points and just get us on our way here. First, as always, I want to draw your attention to the question section of your webinar console. There's two tabs right next to each other, handouts and questions. So let's start in that questions tab. Now, the absolute best part of a webinar like this is the chance to ask questions directly of an expert like Roger. Now, I know that this topic is going to get all your juices flowing, so make sure to get those questions into Roger. And if we're unable to get to your question in the live session, don't worry about that. The Know Before team will be following up with you after the event. A quick reminder that the questions console is also a great place to say hi, you can reach out to the other members of the audience, also reach out to the actual tech media team. So if you have any technical issues that come up during the session, knock on wood, of course, don't forget that a browser refresh is going to get rid of most of the usual tech gremlins, but if not, just shoot us a message and that questions tab will be there to help. Okay, so I mentioned that the side by side questions section handouts tab. So in that handouts tab right there, there's lots of exciting resources to go along with the webinar today. Definitely worth checking out. So make sure you go in there, click around and explore. You're also going to find the link to the Gorilla Guide book club and the actual tech media webinar calendar. So be sure to explore that handout section and get some of those awesome resources. Now, it is not just great content that we're giving away today. We also have a $300 Amazon gift card as a prize drawing at the end of our webinar. Of course, you must be in attendance at the live webinar in order to qualify for the prize and all winners must meet the actual tech media prize terms and conditions. Now, if you're saying to yourself, sounds great, but I don't know what those are, no problem. Head on over to that handout section, click in, scroll down to the bottom, and you'll find that full T's and C's that in that handout section for you. Now, I know that this crew is not going to need any additional nudging to ask questions, especially when it comes to ransomware. But hey, we love curiosity here. So today we will also be giving away a $50 Amazon gift card to the best question asked. Now, keep in mind that the team will review all the questions asked after the event, which means that even if your question does not get read out in our live Q&A, there's still a chance to win. And as always, we will reach out via email to our lucky winner after the webinar wraps. Okay, well, that's it for housekeeping. So let's get into our session. Now, I'm guessing that you are all here today because you are interested in or worried about ransomware, maybe both. Some of you may be feeling totally prepared and others may feel completely vulnerable. So I like to think about a session like this as kind of a survival guide. You know that you're venturing out into the wilderness, you know that the way will be dangerous and the threats are out there, but you also know, well, you just have to keep going. So what tools do you need? What direction do you go in? What do you carry with you to help avoid those dangerous obstacles? And what first aid kit do you need in the case that the threats do catch up to you? So anyone who has ever gone out on an adventure in the wild, whatever wild is to you, knows that the planning and preparation phase is key to your mission success. And luckily today, we're joined by author, expert, and incredible storyteller, Roger Grimes, data-driven security evangelist at Know Before. Roger, I know you have a lot of information to help us avoid, face, and recover from potential threats in our path. So I will hand the mic on over to you. Thank you, Jess, and thanks everybody for showing up for my Ransomware Hostage Rescue Checklist, your step-by-step -step guide to preventing and surviving a ransomware attack. Uh, you know, what I hope this talk is, is literally a step-by-step -step guide of what you can do if you've been hit by ransomware. I'm going to cover some other stuff like how to prevent ransomware and how it works, but, you know, I, I see so many talks that talk about, I'm going to tell you how to respond to ransomware. I am going to tell you step-by-step -step what you do in the first minute, the first, you know, the second minute, 10 minutes, an hour, the first day. This is truly going to be a step-by-step. -step. What do you do if you get hit by ransomware? Jess introduced me, but I've been doing computer security for 34 years. My name is Roger Grimes. Uh, I've written 13 books, over 1,200 magazine articles. One of those books is called The Ransomware Protection Playbook. 
And I think this uh, this webinar is really, uh, I think even, I don't want to say better than the book, but it really has the step-by-step -step checklist I'm going to show you today I wish I had in that book. So I think this has really got some really good information uh, that's not in the book. So uh, good stuff to, uh, to, to, to learn about. Uh, I work for Know Before. We're the world's largest integrated security awareness training and simulated fishing platform vendor. Uh, we try to help people not to be fished. And that's important because that uh, phishing and social engineering is the number one way that all hackers and malware and ransomware attack people. And we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. Uh, but we're going to start off by talking about how to prevent ransomware, because if you can't prevent it, you really can't tell what it's going to do. And it creates a lot of mess and, you know, really big ransoms and downtime. And uh, nobody wants to hit by a ransomware attack. So we're going to talk start out by, by talking about how to prevent it and then step by step incident response and then take Q&A at the end. Uh, most of the information I'm going to provide you today actually comes out of the Noble 4 Ransomware Hostage Rescue Manual. Uh, you can download that at the link there. We get it out of the resources. I've uh, helped write the last couple of years. And this year, uh, that new edition there, I wrote, I, I think, the majority of stuff. And certainly there's a checklist in it uh, that we're going to discuss today that's in that document that you can download, get more detail. Uh, but when we're trying to worry about ransomware, you know, you try to prepare and defend yourself against hitting, being hit by ransomware. But if you think you were hit by it, you, we then have to identify it, verify you've been hit by ransomware, respond to it minimize the damage and then recover and we'll be covering all of these phases today including again it's very important to prevent a ransomware attack and i think to prevent one you need to kind of understand how sophisticated most ransomware is today most ransomware victims are connected to the internet uh, when they get hit by ransomware although you don't have to necessarily be connected to the internet sometimes the ransomware gangs call sometimes they pay trusted insiders to execute ransomware sometimes they um, will uh, drop off USB keys. They've mailed victims USB keys claiming to be from, you know, some government organization or something and trick people into running them and they get infected. But most victims get infected, uh, exploited on the internet. Typically, they get tricked into executing a Trojan horse program that then impacts, the infects, exploits their device and installs itself in such a way that uh, it can live through a reboot. That's like step one for what's called the stager Trojan. Typically, it's not the ransomware program itself, but some precursor stager program. Um, sometimes it can happen because the victim has unpatched software, like unpatched VPN software that the attacker exploits. And then other times, it's really common for the attacker to already have the victim's login credentials. Like they walk up to the victim's remote desktop protocol login, RDP login, and they put in a login name and password. They don't guess, boom, they're in. Those are the three main ways that ransomware spreads today. I'll come back to this again shortly, but it's uh, social engineering, unpatched software, and password issues of some sort. And if you want to stop ransomware, that's really what you have to concentrate on. But either way, eventually a stager Trojan horse program gets in, infects the first device in an environment. Typically, it's going to collect passwords that are in people's browsers uh, or that you're typing in why it's dwelling. Um, you know, if you have a browser and you go to a website and the browser says, hey, do you want me to remember passwords so we can log you in faster next time? That's stored in the browser. Most Trojan horse programs uh, look for those sort of passwords and browsers and then uploads them to the command and control servers, which are on the Internet somewhere. Uh, typically, it's going to download. The stager program is going to download, get instructions. And there is instructions get, uh, from the hacker that are on the command and control server. They can tell this the stager program to do anything. But typically, the stager program is then going to download at least two other malware programs that are completely unrelated to itself, install them in two different places on your device. And all of them are unscannable, but it's doing so in the hopes that if your antivirus endpoint detection response software detects one of the versions of the malware, you don't detect the other two. If it detects two, it doesn't detect the third. So we'll have a lot of victims that say, oh, we found this ransomware program before it went off and we saved ourselves. But then two months later, we got hit again by ransomware and it was so bad. It was much worse the second time around. It, it wasn't a separate event. They just didn't clean up all the malware from the first event. That's really common. If you know, That's why we recommend that you do a complete rest restoration or a complete renew, rebuild, and you don't just try to uh, figure out what's bad and recover because a lot of times you'll miss stuff. But uh, And let me say the developers of the ransomware and the stager and the malware programs uh, monitor the antivirus sites to see when those sites start to detect their malware program. Typically, they'll monitor a website called VirusTotal. Uh, Google has a website called VirusTotal.com. 
Uh, uh, and if you go there, it has uh, these days 83 antivirus engines running. And it was meant to be by Google for people that if their antivirus didn't detect malware, but they still thought they had malware, maybe they didn't have an antivirus program at all. Anybody can today go to VirusTotal.com and drop off a suspected malicious file or a suspected malicious link and VirusTotal with the 83 antivirus engines will scan it and then they'll tell you how many antivirus engines think that it's malicious or not. It's a, it's a good thing, but the attackers now have a really good spot to monitor to see when antivirus starts to detect their stuff and they'll send through the command and control server and tell the malware programs to update themselves or re-encrypt themselves. So in this way, uh, ransomware is... Uh, you know, in the stager programs, usually are living many weeks to even months, even years. Uh, but the average time, I think, is weeks now. It used to be uh, 8 to 12 months was the average dwell time undetected. But I, I heard it's moved down to just many, many weeks. Uh, but the malware will usually download, uh, take instructions from the hacker. The hacker will log into the command and control servers. They get a list of what the malware has broken into, usually by IP address and network name and host name. They can kind of figure out what they've broken into, decide what, you know, they're, they're trying to get the most money, decide what type of company that they're finally going to go into. But sometimes, pro, uh, you know, these companies are broken into, again, for weeks, months, even years before the hacker kind of comes in and does their thing. Hacker will typically log in to exploited computers using, uh, you know, the same way that the uh, regular admins and users log into their computers remotely. So if your company uses Microsoft Remote Desktop Protocol, RDP, that's what the attacker will use. If you use Logman or VNC or whatever method you use to log in remotely, that's what they're going to do because it's really difficult for your, uh, you know, defense defensive systems to know what's the difference between a legitimate person logging in using the normal method and attacker using the normal method. And it's just harder to, for the hacker to be discovered. Uh, typically, they're going to spread malware around the network. The hacker is going to upload a lot of scripts. A lot. They're going to use a lot of the built-in tools of the operating systems that are in their environment. It's called living off the land, and that's because those executables and, and things like that are less likely to be detected as malicious. They'll usually collect passwords of everybody that's logging into everything. So if you're at work, not only do they get your work passwords and different work websites, but if you're logging into, you know, your stock account, your bank account, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, they're getting all of those passwords as you type them and they're being sent to the command and control center. Again, the hackers will dwell in there. They'll analyze stuff. They're going to eavesdrop on email. They're almost always drop off some email rules that make them get copies of emails from the C-level employees. They'll also monitor IT and IT security in the help desk. Uh, so they can get early warning if somebody, when someone starts to report that they're, you know, discovers their malware. They'll download financial statements to find out how much money the company makes so they can determine how much ransom they want to charge. Uh, they're also stealing information, stealing intellectual property, stealing what's called crown jewel information because they're eventually going to tell that that uh, victim, you either pay us money or we're going to release this information uh, to other hackers, the public or your competitors or malware or something. So the hackers come in, assess, analyze the target, steal whatever they want. Then if it's you know ransomware, they're going to then launch the encryption process. This is the way that most ransomware works today. Somewhere between 86 to 90% of ransomware works in this very sophisticated, uh, you know, hybrid malware, uh, human adversary method. Uh, only 10% of ransomware just, you know, just encrypts your software, just encrypts data. So if you get something that just encrypts your data and doesn't steal the credentials and doesn't steal the data, consider yourself lucky you got one of the, the stupid ones. Um, again, today we call it, the media calls it double extortion. I call it quintuple extortion because that's what it is. But it's still in credentials, anything that anybody types in or uses, not just for the company, uh, but for employees and the employees' personal accounts. If you have an on-site customer website, they're taking the customer credentials. They're stealing down intellectual property, threatening to leak the data. They're threatening the victims, employees, and customers. If the victim company doesn't pay, they'll send uh, an extortion letter to the employees and the customers going, hey, Roger didn't care about your information enough to protect your uh, information. And he didn't, he didn't care enough about you to pay a ransom, a small ransom to prevent us from uh, having to do this. But because they didn't pay, we're going to threaten you and get the money out of you. And if you don't, we're then going to make, you know, your life a living hell or something like that. Uh, they also will do other things like uh, they may do denial of service attacks. They may do crypto mining, you know, to generate Bitcoin or something. A lot of times they're going to publicly shame their victims. They, the uh, hackers, ransomware gangs have their own Instagram sites and Facebook accounts and stuff like that. 
uh, unless they get shut down. Uh, but they'll usually uh, publicly shame the victim and say, we broke into Rogers, you know, a ne network. And here's an example of the files we stole. And here's some of his employee information. Uh, but this is important because you need to know that a, a backup alone is not going to save you right? A backup saves you, a really good backup saves you from encrypted files, but this quintuple extortion stuff is a whole lot of other stuff, and it has nothing to do with a backup, and a backup alone is not going to save you. And this is important to understand that malware is completely different today, or the ransomware, than it used to be. And everybody in your company needs to know it's not just about file encryption today. Somewhere between 40 to 60 percent of uh, ransomware customers pay the ransom, and many of them do today because of the stolen information and credentials not because of the encrypted files. Uh, also, you need to recognize that ransomware is not your real problem. It's how the ransomware got in. Uh, you know, did it get in because of social engineering or unpatched software or you know stolen credentials or a USB key? You need to figure that out because whatever way that the ransomware got in, that's a vulnerability in your defenses. And even if ransomware was to go away and never come back again, if you don't close the way that the ransomware got in, well, it's just going to be something else using the same vulnerabilities and holes, right? It'd just be a password stealing Trojan or wiperware or something like that. So if you want to stop ransomware and really all hackers and malware from getting in, you need to figure out what are the methods they use to do the initial root access and then stop them. Well, here's the 12 or 13 ways that all hackers and malware, uh, regardless of their intent, how they break into victims, right? Here's a list of the things. I've been uh, tracking this for like 22 years uh, and every hacker malware program has used one of these same 12 or 13 methods and if you want to stop hackers and malware and ransomware, you need to figure out what are the most common, most likely ways that they're going to get on in and then uh, mitigate those most likely methods. And that's the way you decrease security risk. You need to stop the initial root access of how hackers and malware and ransomware break in, create mitigations, uh, figure out a ranked list of how you're most likely to be compromised, uh, and then fight those methods first and best. That's how you fight hackers in ransomware. Uh, if I take a look at how ransomware in particular, so as a subset out of all hackers and malware, how does ransomware end up getting initial access into companies? Uh, I found six reports, only six reports out of the like 130 I've looked at in ransomware that talks about how they break in. But you can see that social engineering is involved in about 50% of all attacks. It's actually overall... Uh, social engineering is involved in about 70 to 90 percent of all hacker and malware attacks, but in uh, ransomware, it's only about 50 percent. It still is the number one way that ransomware gets into a device in an environment, followed by unpatched software, was, which is around a quarter percent. And then there are these other categories that are saying either credential theft or password guessing or some remote server attack or third party you know, it, it gets kind of confusing about what do they mean by those other categories. So we know that social engineering is number one. Unpatched software is a really big cause, about a quarter. And then it seems like it's password issues in some way. When they say remote desktop protocol, RDP, that's a really common way that uh, ransomware in particular gets in. But sometimes they're just going up to an RDP terminal, putting in a login name and password that they previously stole through social engineering. Uh, so it's all kind of commingled together. Uh, and what I would say again is that if you're trying to stop ransomware, you want to mitigate social engineering, you want to patch your software, and you want to, um, you know, take care of your password issues, which we'll talk about. There are other ways that ransomware can break in. Again, they do USB keys and they bribe employees. There's a famous case of a Tesla employee that was offered a million dollars by a Russian in Las Vegas to sm smuggle uh, ransomware into Tesla, but the Tesla employee told uh, his company's uh, you know, police enforcement company, they got the real uh, law enforcement, and they arrested the Russian. Uh, we can't arrest Russians in Russia, but we can arrest Russians in Las Vegas. Uh, and there's other ways. I mean, like sometimes some of the ransomware uh, people will call a victim and uh, fake like they're a leader and that, you know, like they're a company leader and they need a password reset or something like that. Or they tell the person, oh, we're the government. We need you to run this USB key or whatever it might be. But the vast majority of the ways are what I talked about before. Uh, if you're falling asleep now, pay attention here because this is super important. 
these are the top defenses of how you prevent all hackers and malware and ransomware. Number one is mitigate social engineering. Remember, social engineering is involved in 70 to 90 percent of all hacker and malware attacks, 50 percent of social engineering. So if you want to stop uh, 50 percent of ransomware, if you want to stop ransomware, you need to mitigate social engineering using the best combination, defense and death combination, your policies, technical defenses, uh, technical defenses like firewalls and antivirus, endpoint detection, secure configuration and that sort of stuff and education, because no matter how good your policies or technical defenses are, some badness will get to some end user sometimes and they have to be educated how to recognize it and how not to be exploited by it. Uh, patch internet accessible software. Uh, unpatched software is involved in at least a quarter of ransomware attacks and 20 to 40 percent of all attacks. Uh, really, you don't need to patch everything. Uh, really, what you need to do is just patch the software that the bad guys use to exploit companies. And really, out of all software vulnerabilities, like last year, there were over 20,000 software vulnerabilities announced. Uh, less than 4% of them were ever used by any bad guy to exploit any company in the real world. Those are really the ones you have to patch, not everything, just that 4%. And you say, Roger, how do I know what the 4% is? Glad you asked. The U.S. Cyber Infrastructure and Security Agency, CISA, uh, actually has a, a feature known as the Known Exploited Vulnerabilities Catalog, and you can subscribe to that. And if you do, they'll send you emails every day or every week and tell you what software is being exploited by the bad guys. And if you have software that's on that list, then you need to for sure make sure you patch it ASAP. You also want to use non-fishable phishing resistant multi-factor authentication. And that's because hackers love using and stealing passwords. So try to use multi-factor non-fishable phishing resistant MFA where you can. Um, and you know, if you're not sure what I mean by phishing resistant MFA, I've got a link there to my to a LinkedIn article I wrote called "List of Good Strong MFA." Uh, unfortunately, 90-95% of MFA is easily fishable and it can be stolen or, or bypassed as easily as your password. Uh, so, if you're going to use MFA, use phishing resistant MFA. And again, I got a link uh, on LinkedIn there if you want to find out what I mean by non fishable phishing resistant MFA. Uh, where you have to use passwords, make sure you use a unique and different password in every site and service. And really, I recommend a password manager if you can, because it can make truly unique. Uh, perfectly random, a perfectly random 11, 12 character password is unguessable, uncrackable. But if you make your own passwords, they have to be complex and, and 18, 20 characters long. And who wants to make a 20 character password? Instead, use a password manager. Whether or not you use a password manager, make sure every website uses a different, every site and service you use has a different password, uh, unguessable password. Also teach yourself and your friends, your family and your coworkers how to spot rogue URLs, bad links. Most social engineering involves those bad links. And so if you teach them uh, you know, how to spot a bad link, and if you're not sure to do, how to teach somebody about what a good link versus a bad link is, I got some links there for you. That first link there is an, a link to an article I have on a rogue your the 12 most common rogue url tricks and that bottom one is a one hour webinar where i cover like over 50 different examples of rogue url links and what you should have noticed that to make them uh to notice they were rogue uh if you want to know everything you can to stop phishing uh, i have a one hour uh, webinar with 99 slides or a 46 page ebook take your poison but it's everything in my head and no before his head that we could think of to stop and mitigate social engineering and phishing those are really good guides. Uh, if you're interested in ransomware in particular, we have a ransomware portal. Go to nobefore.com forward slash ransomware. And we've got a ton of stuff, a lot of it that I've written, a lot of webinars and stuff like that, just a ton of stuff, including the ransomware simulator. That's some software that you can run that will simulate at least a dozen different ransomware programs uh, and also a crypto, a common crypto miner. And your antivirus endpoint detection software should detect those simulated ransomware programs. Uh, but we're going to assume that despite your best efforts to prevent ransomware, that maybe you got hit by ransomware. Maybe you thought you got hit by ransomware. We're going to talk about a step-by-step -step response. And again, this step-by-step -step checklist I'm getting ready to cover is in our ransomware hostage rescue manual that you can download. Or if you just want to download the couple of page step-by-step -step checklist that I covered today, you can do that. So those are good things to download and use and you get them out of the resources as well. And again, uh, you know, you want to prepare for ransomware. You want to create a ransomware response plan. You want to create a ransomware response plan. You want to communicate it to other people that are going to be involved in the ransomware response and recovery. 
and practice it at least once a year, table practice it at least once a year with all the involved parties. And if you have vendors you're gonna call, you have them involved. But the idea is that it's not a surprise on anybody and you wanna educate uh, anyone to remove the, uh, if you have any cowboys or cowgirls, meaning really good IT people. What's interesting, a lot of people, if they get a ransomware response plan, they're like, oh, okay, this looks good. And then they get by ransomware and everybody starts freaking out and people start doing different things. And the really smart cowboys or cowgirls and organizations are like, I know this friend to call and he can save it and we can go to the internet and download this. You, you need to tell people, follow the ransomware response plan. We don't want cowboys or cowgirls doing, you know, normal things trying to help us because, you know, like one example is you're not supposed to allow anybody to communicate with them, anybody outside the organization if it's not done by a lawyer. And that's because anything anyone does can be called into court. A lot of people that get hit by ransomware get called in the court by people that feel offended or hurt or damaged by the ransomware attack. And anything, if your lawyer makes those same emails or calls, they're protected uh, client attorney privilege. But if your regular cowboy cowgirl makes that call, that can be uh, more easily turned over to a uh, prosecuting attorney. So you want to make sure everybody knows the plan and knows to practice the plan if you get hit in a real event. Uh, of course, if you have ransomware, your email is typically gonna be down, your instant messaging might be down. So you might have to have an alternative communications method known, like everybody knows, okay, if we get hit, we're going to WhatsApp or something like that. And if you're gonna have people that are on the team, you have to communicate those phone numbers or those contact list information and make sure that it's you know saved outside the company because your company's servers could be down. So you want to have an alternate communication method that's known and any contact list method is known and distributed and known externally. Have that call sheet again, print it up and it's put it, you know, it's in someone's shelf at home or all the people that are involved shelf or at least on their cell phone, something that is less likely to be uh, caught up in the ransomed data. And also decide ahead of time if you're going to pay the ransom or not. Some companies are like, we're never paying the ransom and that's cool. Uh, and there's other people that aren't sure whether they will or not, but you want to, if you're one of those companies that may pay the ransom, you want to determine that ahead of time because it involves legal and getting, uh, you know, senior management and legal and the CEO or president or whatever. And, and they have to come to the idea, are we going to pay the ransom? Because that is one of the major decisions. You don't want to be making that decision when you're hit by ransomware because people tend not to always do the best thing. Uh, you want to determine ahead of time. And if you think you as a company are not going to pay the ransom, well, that will determine and change some of the steps uh, that you might do when we go by this step-by-step -step response. So know that ahead of time. Have senior management and the legal team decide ahead of time, is your company possibly going to pay the ransom we hit by ransom? It doesn't mean you're going to pay the ransom, but are you possibly going to do it? Because if you're not, uh, again, that will save you a step or two um, it may not make it easier or cheaper, uh, but it changes the way that your company is going to respond if it gets hit by ransomware. Uh, and again, you should always have a ransomware incident response plan already. And really it should be, you know, you should already have a disaster recovery plan that talks about what your company is going to do if it gets by a disaster. And a disaster can be many things, it can be a hurricane, a tornado, a fire, a flood, or whatever. Uh, you should already have a business continuity plan, and that is talking about how you operate the business while the disaster is being re responded from. And also the, the business continuity plan should tell you what software, what features that you need to recover in what order when you're coming back up from a disaster recovery. So that part of the business continuity plan is very important. Again, the list of uh, software that is mission critical to your company and what needs to come up in what order. And you should already have an incident response plan. That's what you do when you get attacked by something, a big cyber something. Uh, and so your ransomware, you should have a specific ransomware incident response plan because it is a very common type of disaster and incident that people have to respond to. And there's special little questions that may be in it that are in no other disaster type, like are you going to pay the ransom or not? Uh, but you should already have the disaster recovery plan, the business continuity plan, incident response plan, and your ransomware incident response plan is just a subcomponent of those plans, but you're gonna need those other uh, parent plans to do the whole process. But now let's assume, okay, you've been hit by ransomware. What do you do? Step one is, to make sure that you've actually been hit by ransomware. There are some fake ransomware programs. A lot of these come out of Iran, uh, but there, there's a lot of these that will kind of put on someone's screen. You've been hit by ransomware, you need to pay the ransom. 
But if you hit escape or reboot the machine, they go away or they may try to go away. They may try to auto launch. But if you go look at the files on those impacted systems, they're, they're not really encrypted. Uh, you want to look and see, is it really ransomware? Uh, you know, do I have encrypted files? Is, is it a, you know, is it a, a, a guaranteed, uh, is it guaranteed to be ransomware? Have they actually encrypted files? Do I have a legitimate note and are there files that are really encrypted and this system's not coming back up or the files that they're encrypted are definitely encrypted? Um, you also want to make sure that it's not wiperware. Uh, wiperware, uh, which comes out, of, a lot of it comes out of Russia, but it also been used in Iran against Saudi Arabia, is this so, uh, software that just starts formatting hard drives or, or memory or hard drive spaces. And if it doesn't format the whole disk, it's formatting the file allocation table and partition table, which is going to have the addresses where these files are located. Um, there have been large uh, ransomware looking programs. Russia did that against Ukraine and against uh, Estonia where they actually sent what looked like ransomware messages saying, you have to pay us a ransom, uh, but it wasn't a ransom. It was wiperware and it's really wiping out the hard drive. So, and that's important to know. Um, you know, if, it, if it's fake ransomware, that's cool. Not a big deal. Uh, what's called scareware. If it's wiperware, you're going to have to start running and shutting machines down right and left, which is not necessarily what you're going to do if you have real ransomware. The other thing to determine is, do you have more than one device that's exploited by the ransomware or one location? And that's because if you have it just on one device and nobody else has reported it, it may be the type of uh, direct action Trojan ransomware that just infects the machine that it's on. 10% of ransomware just infects the machine that it's on. Uh, but as soon as you have a second machine, that's meaning that it's spreading over the network and that's going to determine and change what you do. Um, so if you, you know, if you think it's really ransomware and let me say that you're probably, if it's one machine, not going to declare an official ransomware response because just one machine, but it, if it is ransomware and it, it, it's more than one machine, then you're probably as step two going to declare a real ransomware event and start the official incident response, you initiate however it is, Hey, we're declaring an official ransomware, you know, event. Uh, everybody should know their predefined roles and expectations. Typically, that's going to send team members uh, doing many different things. You know, you're contacting senior management to let them know. You're contacting IT management, IT senior management, senior management. Uh, maybe you're, you know, you're getting legal involved because remember, legal is going to now communicate with everybody externally. Maybe you're getting your PR teams involved because PR or marketing is going to have to start writing memos to employees and customers and stakeholders about what's going on. Uh, you know, you're notifying everybody. Everybody's beginning to do whatever the predefined roles are. Um, and then usually if you've got ransomware uh, versus, uh, you know, something else, uh, maybe even wiperware as well. You can disconnect it eh, more for ransom with wiperware. You're going to be turning machines off because you're trying to stop formatting from happening. But with ransomware, you're typically going to disconnect uh, impacted devices from the network. And let me say this is some people will say it used to be, hey, if you're being hit by ransomware, shut off all the devices, power them down because the ransomware could be encrypting more files. That's not what most uh, incident response ransomware people say today. Most of the time we say leave those devices on. First of all, by the time you get involved, most of the ransomware encryption stuff's done. If you turn off a machine in the middle of it encrypting files, you could make those files unrecoverable. Uh, and you may think, well, I got to take backup. A lot of times the ransomware guys corrupt backups or delete backups. and You really don't have the backup that you thought. So your only hope of getting back that data on that device may be to pay the ransom and get the recovery key and respond that way. And you don't want to shut down uh, uh, an encrypting ransomware computer in the middle of it. But we, what we usually say is leave them on, but we don't want to. A lot of ransomware and hacker stuff is trying to spread and spread and hit more machines. Uh, and they can't hit all machines at once. They'll usually pre-stage ransomware Trojans at particular machines. And when they say encrypt, uh, you know, a lot of them go off. But, you know, there's there still ones that are spreading and ones that haven't encrypted. Uh, so you want to disconnect the network in order to prevent the spread. We used to say, well, go to the machine and power it down. We don't say power it down anymore. We used to say go to the machine and disable all networking and USB and wireless and all that stuff. 
these days, it's far faster just to disconnect all the networking equipment that allows them to be networked. So go to your VLANs and your routers and your bridges and, your, you know, and, and that's where you disable networking. So you're actually leaving networking enabled on the impacted devices or unimpacted devices. So I guess they'd be impacting that you're disabling networking, uh, but you're, you're not allowing uh, them to actually connect over the network. So you should ahead of time decide how you're going to disable your networking, you know, whether it's on a router, a switch, a bridge, a VLAN, whatever it might be, software defined network, uh, and figure out ahead of time how you're going to disable all of those networks uh, and then and practice that so that when you go to disable the network, you're not having to uh, hunt and peck and see what works and what doesn't work. You've practiced it. You know what to do, uh, but you want to disable, you know, any certainly any Internet connections. And most companies have multiple Internet connections. You want to disable anything that allows these devices to talk. I've seen some guides, including uh, our own guys, that talk about disabling anything like, you know, uh, Bluetooth and that sort of stuff. Y you can uh, we don't, in real life though, we don't see a lot of, uh, Bluetooth being used to impact other things. Really, you want to get rid, you know, disconnect the regular networking ethernet type stuff, but again, do it at a, a, a network at the network device points. And, and, and that's good too, because, you know, you, if you disable it on a network device on a port by port basis, you can enable it by a port by port basis. So there's going to be different machines that you want to bring up at different times and test and that sort of stuff. And if you have done it at the network device, it's easier to then re-enable networking and re-enable networking just for particular IP addresses and ports and that sort of stuff. If you actually disable networking on each device and machine, it could take somebody physically vis visiting all those devices. Uh, so it can make it you know tougher um, to do recovery than if you just do it at the network device level. Um, step four here is you want to determine the scope of the exploitation. This is really kind of the, you have an everybody go around and find out, okay, who got hit, what locations, what operating systems, what applications, what types of files. Most ransomware programs don't encrypt everything on the disk. They encrypt a subset, just the data files, because it's faster. Um, but they'll sometimes miss stuff, get stuff. Uh, I have people say, oh, you know, they didn't really encrypt the data that we were really worried about. But you want to know, like, did they only hit Windows machines? Did they only hit Linux machines? Did they hit your Apple machines? Did they hit devices? What locations? What types of files were impacted? What, you know, what wasn't? This is really a big deal because you're trying to find out the extent that's going, you know, the damage and the scope of the exploitation. And this is going to drive the rest of your steps. You're even going to look to see most people today have network attached storage drives and cloud drives, and you want to see where they impacted. Um, if you do, this is important. If someone finds a ransomware extortion message, usually ransomware is going to put a message on the screen saying you need to send me an email at this anonymous email address. You need to connect to it. They'll tell you you need to download and connect a Tor browser or something. Uh, whatever that link is, don't click it yet. A lot of times the ransomware people don't know that they've infected a particular client because it's all being driven by malware uh, and they don't know when you notice it. A lot of times they're going to kick off this ransomware on a weekend before a holiday. Uh, they're trying to you know, hurt the company the most. Um, and if you click on that link, it usually is going to start a countdown counter. And most ransomware groups want to get paid within a month. I'm sorry, within a week. Uh, and typically, they're going to try to hurt you, uh, your company, uh, in such a way that you're going to, they know nobody wants to pay the ransom, but they're going to hurt the company to hopefully get a decision within a day or two to make you realize you're going to pay the ransom or not. And then, uh, you know, then they're going to ask for their payment in cryptocurrency or whatever, and you're going to have to open up anonymous email accounts and wallets or get somebody that's doing it as an agent on behalf of you. And you, uh, you know, if you click on that message, it starts that countdown. So you want to not click on that message until you really, uh, that link until you really have to. So collect all the information, uh, assume until otherwise disproven that the ransomware has been in for months, weeks, or months of time. That's what it usually is in for many weeks. Now, the average total time, again, is many, many weeks, if not months and years. Uh, you want to assume there's multiple different types of ransomware programs and tools and scripts and things involved. You want to assume that they've exfiltrated your most valuable data. You want to assume that they have eavesdropped on your emails and probably have email rules involved. You want to assume that they've stolen all the passwords that were stored and used Why the malware was dwelling, you want to assume that they publicly posted the compromise about you and you won't be able to hide this from the general public. And you want to assume that your backups are potentially compromised. I have a lot of people that are like, 
you know, oh, we got backups, we're safe. And they tell the ransomware guy, you know, go go blow smoke. We're not paying you, we got backups. And it turns out their backups were either uh, not really good, were compromised, or it just is going to take 2,000 years to do all the restoration using your good backups. So just assume until you know otherwise that your backups are potentially compromised. And let me say, even if, you know, IT guy that's in charge of backup initially tells you that, no, our backups are fine. Uh, that's probably what half the... Uh, IT backup people say because they thought their backups were fine, but really they were compromised. Uh, you do also have to determine, did they, you know, did they steal your data most of the time? Again, 86, 90 percent of the time ransomware is stealing data and your credentials. But, you know, check your if you have any data leak prevention software, check logs for that. Check your, you know, see if you can find any large archival files, zip files, arc files, LARC files that are around on the Internet that, you know, gigabits big. A lot of times the bad guys will copy data from your database servers, they'll, they'll shut down your database servers, your email servers, do some mass extraction, and you'll see remnants of those files sitting around somewhere. Look for malware and tools and scripts uh, that they could have been used to copy data. Um, and then, you know, I would say that most ransomware that steals data tells you they've stolen your data. And again, well, many times if you say, give me proof of life, as we call it, we'll prove to you they've taken your data. Uh, I, I say 84% or more of ransomware does data exfiltration. It's 86 to 90% now. Uh, but again, uh, you know, if they say they've taken your data, they probably have. But occasionally we do come across ransomware groups that say they stole their data and they really didn't. Or the data they stole, you know, I have some clients like, man, they got this data that was nothing. I can't believe they missed our most valuable data. And they got this old skunk data that we don't really care about. Um, you know, look for credential theft checks. Look to see, you know, if they've been usually ransomware has stolen all your credentials, uh, certainly all your network credentials, uh, if not more. And you want to look to see if you have unusual logins between weird machines in different places. Uh, you can also check password dump sites and services. You can check Troy's Hunt, have I been pond.com to see if your company's credentials are showing out there. Or we've got a really good uh, tool called the Password Exposure Test Tool that's free uh, that will look at the different uh, uh, dark web and, and public websites to see if your uh, company's login names and passwords are showing up anywhere. Or you, if you're really good, you, know, you can even run uh, Recon NG or something to see if your company's passwords are sitting out there. If you don't know about Recon NG, it's a, just a really good Linux tool that hackers use to look for leak credentials all the time. It does lots of other stuff, but that's one of the things Recon NG will do. Uh, you also want to see if you can determine the type of ransomware. Typically, they tell you in the screen, but you're also trying to determine kind of the version. So you want to take a picture of any ransomware screens. Uh, and a lot of times you, you want to eventually work with ransomware experts that are familiar with a particular type of ransomware. And that's because they have a better chance of recovery. If you're going to do negotiations with them, they kind of know how that group is going to respond. And they also know like the groups that are bad. There are some ransomware groups like out of Iran and North Korea that they're not going to release your data, even if you pay them the ransom. And insurance companies know it and people that are experienced in ransomware recovery know who kind of the, the good and that they're all bad, but the good and the bad out of ransomware, who, who you can trust the word of what they say and who where you can't. Um, then, you know, you want to figure out what, you know, you, you want to limit the initial damage. And hopefully you've done that by, uh, you know, disabling the network and looking at things like that. Then you want to gather your team. So after you've stopped the damage from occurring further, you gather your team. And this is all usually in the first day. Uh, that you're going to uh, gather the team together and share all the information that everyone knows in uh, that public private forum, uh, you know, and uh, should have lots of people to it. And, and don't assume everybody knows everything. I've been in many ransomware uh, reviews where everybody, you know, one person thought that everybody knew that we had seen that they had exfiltrated the data and nobody else knew that. So make sure everybody's sharing all the facts around everybody and that everybody agrees with a conclusion on what they have and document, document, document. Uh, so that you don't have to recover the same information other people as you bring them into the recovery group. Uh, and again, don't be shocked if some new information changes the initial assessment. Like someone will say, oh, it's only the Windows machines. And later on, oh, they got our Linux servers too. So it, it's, you know, it's just par for the course when you're doing an unknown thing. Uh, step seven, you got to decide whether you're paying the ransom or not. That's a big deal because if you're not paying the ransom, uh, then you're doing recovery one way. If you decide you're paying the ransom, then you've got to get together somebody that's going to help you pay the ransom, negotiate the 
ransom and figure out how much you're going to pay and how you're going to go through that process and when you're going to pay and all that sort of stuff. Uh, also, you got to decide, are you going to repair or rebuild? Most companies repair, meaning that they just they look for the ransomware and they, they get rid of it and they recover from it. I'm not a big believer in that. I think you should do a complete rebuild or brand new of everything because you never know when you're not going to be leaving something else behind. And let me say that if you're not paying the ransom, the complete rebuild new machines is a far better option than repair. Repair is a little bit better uh, if you uh, pay the ransom because they're less likely to hit you. But if you don't pay the ransom, you're far more likely to be hit by the same group. I do see a lot of surveys that say that ransomware groups frequently re-hit people they hit. Not typically if you pay the ransom, it's not used at the same ransomware group uh, hitting the same victim. If they did, nobody, if that happened all the time, nobody would ever pay the ransom. So most ransomware groups, if you pay them, uh, are not going to hit you again. Uh, and, you know, although sometimes you'll have, uh, you know, if you don't fix your vulnerabilities and it's a year or two later, some other group is going to get you. Um, you need to decide if you're going to invite additional external parties. You know, sometimes you're calling your insurance company at this time. If you have insurance involved and you've got these uh, malware, ransomware, incident response brokers that may help you or your IT people or, you're, you know, you're buying hardware and software. And so you need to uh, figure that out. Also, you need to decide, do you need to uh, notify regulatory bodies like law enforcement, CISA, or the FBI? Uh, in the United States, notifying uh, CISA and the FBI can actually give you some legal protection, but these are all things that decisions of senior management and legal should make. Um, you, you know, do you notify authorities? Again, that's up to you. Uh, you do have to be slightly careful because sometimes the authorities can then now take over the process and tell you what you can and can't do. Uh, but typically, I don't know anyone that's been hurt by contacting CISA or the FBI. Uh, although, again, let senior management and legal decide that. You may also have to declare an official data breach event. Be careful when you do that, because in some countries, declaring an official data breach really means a big deal. And it starts a whole bunch of different processes, depending on the country you're in. And so don't say data breach. I think all ransomware attacks are data breaches. But a lot of times legal and other teams, they try their best to squirm out of that and say it wasn't a data breach. And if your lawyers are backing you up and senior management is taking the risk, more power to you if you don't have to declare a data breach. Uh, if you do con if you do contract or contact the ransomware attacker, typically they're gonna ask you to contact them on an email account, anonymous email account, or a dark web tour account. Uh, again, it starts that countdown timer. Uh, typically the hacker wants to be paid within one week. Typically, you know, you can pay less than they request if you're gentle and nice with them. So if they ask for a million bucks, you can pay $500,000 or something. Uh, you know, have somebody competent that negotiates with a ransomware attacker. Uh, there are even professional negotiators that work with particular ransomware groups. Uh, make sure it's, if you decide to go to the professional negotiator, make sure they're reputable. There have been some cases of these ransomware negotiators people thought were reputable, but really all they were doing was, was asking for the most money and they were getting a cut of it. Uh, whatever you do, don't antagonize the ransomware hacker. I see people do this all the time because they're, like, they're pissed. They're mad. They're being ransomed uh, and their stuff's locked up and their software is not working and that sort of stuff. Don't, don't antagonize. No, no one has ever, no one has ever uh, done well by antagonizing a hacker. It may feel good at the moment, but it usually doesn't work. Again, decide ahead of time whether you're going to pay the ransom or not. It's not your decision. It's legal and senior management's to decide. Typically, it's got to be in Bitcoin. If you don't have the Bitcoin or a Bitcoin account, you may, uh, you can, they may have to wait for you to get that, or you can subcontract to somebody that has that sort of information. Uh, there. Uh, step eight is, again, are you going to repair or rebuild the environment? Again, I recommend complete rebuild or something new. A lot of companies have to preserve evidence because um, there may be a court case. And so uh, they'll either take forensics copies of memory and hard drive of machines and then rebuild them, or they just buy brand new machines. That's pretty uh, you know, pretty common. Uh, you need to determine the business impact analysis of what machines and devices to recover when, so you bring it up in the right order. Uh, you're usually going to restore your critical infrastructure first, uh, you know, like your uh, IP address and, and DHCP and your routers and that sort of stuff. So you need to determine ahead of time in your business continuity plan what mission critical apps you need to get back up and working. And just realize that all those apps typically have critical dependencies ahead of time to determine, uh, like your infrastructure. Again, your DNS addresses, your IP, your DHCP, your Active Directory, your IT security teams. Uh, and then usually you're going to open up your networking slowly uh, and only let certain machines that have been cleaned and rebuild uh, come up uh, one at a time across particular ports and, and heavily monitoring it. So if something goes screwy, you can shut down the network quickly again. You do want to make sure that all apps are cleaned and running before you open the internet. 
back up to everybody. Uh, you do need to reset all possibly compromised passwords, not just your network passwords, not just your email passwords, but all possible passwords that they could have because they've been listening into your passwords the entire time that you were compromised. Again, most companies have to preserve evidence. If you're not sure whether you'll need to do that, preserve evidence. Uh, and again, a lot of times at the very minimum, this requires taking memory and disk uh, snapshots before you modify the existing devices. Although a lot of times people are getting new devices and putting on new software and doing new things in the first place. If you go to restore data using a hacker's recovery key, typically what you're going to do is tell the hacker, okay, I need proof of life that your recovery key will work. And so if the hacker is asking for like a million dollars, they're going to ask for like, you know, $80,000 for this proof of life or something. But essentially what they'll do is uh, almost all ransomware uh, programs use multiple ransomware keys and they've intentionally, they do it this way. Part of it is so they can prove to you that, you know, they can recover your environment uh, and, and you're going to pay a partial amount. And then you're going to do that recovery on a, uh, an, you're going to do a backup of the encrypted data and do a restore and recovery in a different location on a different machine. You don't want to do your recovery attempt on the only copy of the data of the encrypted data that you have. So again, make sure when you're restoring data from encrypted files using the hacker decryption keys uh, that you get this proof of life and you try that it works. Don't just pay the whole ransomware amount and think that's going to work because sometimes uh, the, the decryption keys don't work or there's bugs or something like that. So uh, make sure and make sure you do the test to a test location and not on the real device. Uh, as you're trying to bring up your applications, you're doing unit testing, which is uh, you have a team leader that is really trying to look at all the software and trying to make sure, making sure that all the possible, uh, that the, the software is clean and working proper, that all, they try all tested inputs and look at all the outputs and make sure the application is ready to go before they release it and sign off and say, it's ready to go. Uh, when everything's been all clean, you know, turn on the network, turn on the internet, it should be done, you know, on a per device, per port basis, monitor the internet uh, so that if something crazy starts happening, you see the hackers getting back in, you can relock down if it's needed. Uh, a lot of organizations hit by ransomware buy a lot of new stuff. So a lot of times like they were using old server stuff like Windows Server 2012, and now they're going to go to Windows Server 2022, and they're redoing their Active Directory, and they're doing all the things that they said they couldn't do because they were up and didn't want to cause operational interruption. Well, now you have operational interruption, and you might have the time on your hands to be able to do that recovery. When you get through with the whole uh, incident responseware event, you need to review the good, the bad, the ugly, see what went wrong, see where it didn't, and update your ransomware response plan and accordingly, because according to statistics, a lot of companies hit by ransomware get hit again. So you want to make sure you got your lessons learned from that plan. And of course, the, what you should do is figure out how did that ransomware get in? The ransomware group doesn't always know. I know a lot of people go to the ransomware group, we'll pay you, but we want to know how you got in, which is a good question to ask. But a lot of times the ransomware group's like, we don't know. And that's because they bought your access from an access broker and they don't even know how that access broker got your login name and password. But if you can figure out how they broke in, use those prevention steps I talked about before to stop it happening again. Uh, and again, I'm a really big believer in doing a real rebuild of your environment versus just repairing stuff uh, because sometimes you can miss stuff. Um, you know, and it's, you know, figure out how you got hit, make sure you close that hole, put in the new better systems, use multi-factor authentication, fight social engineering, patch your software, use phishing resistant MFA. Those are the things that are most likely going to prevent ransomware from hitting you. Uh, at, at, at know before we're very big believers in that you should train everyone in how to spot social engineering since it's the number one thing. At least once a month, you give people training and how to prevent social engineering. And at least once a month, you send simulated phishing tests to see how well they took that training and people that fell the simulated phishing test should take more training. Uh, our customers that do that, on average, the, a brand new customer that comes to us, on average, about 30% or a third of their workforce uh, will click on any phishing email. But with training and simulated phish testing like we talked about, typically they get that to somewhere around 5% in less than a year. And that's not our best customers. Uh, that's all the customers that do what I just said, which is monthly training and simulated phishing. With that, whew, thanks for putting up with me for 55 minutes. Um, and we're going to take some questions now. I'm going to look through the chat and try to pull some out. If we don't get to your questions today, feel free to email me at rogerg at nova4.com. Uh, and I will answer your questions as quickly as I can. And you can also follow me in LinkedIn or Twitter. So let me see what we got here for questions. Uh, again, stand by here. Uh, got a lot of hellos and that sort of stuff. Um, thank you for, for all the people saying hello to me and all that sort of stuff. Um, 
Let me see if I can find, let's see, newest all this. Uh, do you know what percentage of entities pay the ransomware versus those that don't pay? About 40 to 60%. It changes all the time, but it's pretty, uh, pretty I see 40 to 60% is pretty common. Uh, let me stand by here. Nope. Let me get some more. Um, is there a password saver vault you'd recommend? Um, I'm a big believer. I like password vaults, you know, like CyberArk and that sort of stuff. I'm really, uh, and those are, I, I, I haven't reviewed enough of them lately to be able to say one's better than another. I do like password managers as well. And I think that every, <coughs> excuse, everybody should use a password manager. Um, I'm not going to give you one because uh, all password managers uh, could be a potential uh, customer. Uh, but I would say uh, go to Wired Magazine, go to wired.com, and they have uh, put in a search for password manager. They have a really good, they have two good password review articles. And I think that they're, the recommendations they make are good recommendations. Um, let's see, how does one protect himself before cyber criminal run rampant with this network for it to be safe? I talked about prevention, right? Prevent social engineering, patch all your software, use phishing resistant MFA. Those are the two best things that you could possibly do. Um, I heard that someone says, Ray said, I heard that when you pay the ransomware, it's on the burden of the company to ensure that the attackers are not on the OFAC list. That is true. That kind of comes at this for US people off the US treasury list. You do in, in America, in the U.S., you can actually get in trouble for paying ransom uh, to people. The uh, U.S. Treasury Department says on the OFAC list. Uh, so you need to make sure they're not on that list. There are ransomware people on that list. So make sure you, you know, let your lawyers and senior management decide if you're going to pay. If you have an insurance company, uh, they typically are going to help you with that decision. If you do CISA or the FBI, they're typically going to help you with that situation as well. But, yes, you do need to make sure if you're in the U.S. that they're not on the OFAC list. Um, what's the view of Russia these days? Uh, Russia is the largest purveyor of ransomware and they are cyber criminal safe haven uh, for ransomware groups and other groups there. Um, are they still the greatest uh, ransomware region of fear? By far, ran you know, I don't know what the percentage is, but Russia's probably 80, 90% of the problem. Uh, we also have Ukraine, North Korea, uh, Iran, uh, and I just saw another country the other day. It was a weird country, but uh, they're all bit players. Russia is the biggest problem in it. And, you know, we, we all know we're trying to take care and settle that. Are the well-known ransomware as a service, are well-known ransomware as a service attacks easier to defend against or mitigate if impacted as compared to highly customized or targeted ransomware? Uh, they're all terrible. They're all terrible. Uh, and the ransomware as a service ones may be a bit more uh, just because they update themselves so quickly. Uh, for senior management that may not have cybersecurity in the top of their mind, how would you recommend building a business case for this group? I, I think, you know, I think the average ransom, so 50% of companies get by ransomware in a given year, and the average ransom ranges from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars. And the downtime is always measured in hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars. If you can't make a, a business case for protecting against ransomware, you'll, you'll never make it to management. There are really good statistics uh, all over the place on ransomware attacks. They really vary widely, but the cheapest uh, statistics are still pretty bad. Um, let me see another one. Uh, I know a company was hit by twice by ransomware. They repaired the infrastructure again. Uh, re, you know, a lot of companies they get hit twice. They really get hit twice. They 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 got hit once, but then the attackers were able to get in twice because they had still had some malware sneaking around. Uh, can someone build any hardware tool embedded to prevent ransomware? No, no. All all hardware is is firmware, and firmware all firmware is software. <laughs> And, and software is always buggy. No hardware, firmware based only computer defense solution has ever fully worked. Um, how do you protect social media accounts when you need them to interact with the community? I mean, you know, use uh, phishing resistant MFA to protect them at the very least, is what I would say. That certainly would give you some protection. Um, I think we're running out of time here. Jess may need to come back in, but if you have any more questions and I missed them or you disagree with something I said or want to ask another question, feel free to email me at rogerg at knowbefore.com. And with that, Jess, I'll turn this back over to you. Wow, thank you, Roger, for that wonderful presentation. I, I wish we could keep going with that, but we are completely out of time. So we will have to wrap there and, and hopefully we can pick this up for another conversation again soon. Always a pleasure to chat with you, Roger. Uh, and until then, 
I know what you folks are waiting for out there, so let's get to it. Now, I'm going to remind you again that you must be in attendance here at the webinar in order to qualify for that $300 Amazon gift card. So our lucky winner today is Susan Wright of Virginia. Susan Wright of Virginia, you have won a $300 Amazon gift card. Congratulations. And as always, we will be in touch about claiming your prize after the webinar wraps today. And with that, on behalf of Actual Tech Media team, I want to thank No Before for making this uh, webinar possible. And just a giant thank you to Roger for, as always, an absolutely fascinating presentation. And hey, I'm sending high fives and a special thank you to everyone in the audience today that asked a question uh, and, and just came in and listened and observed and, and uh, chimed in. These, these events are so wonderful to be a part of because they give us all the opportunity to connect and to really dig in and explore some of these ideas together. I always learn a ton. I definitely learned a ton today. My brain is just absolutely buzzing. I hope that you feel the same. I cannot wait to connect with you all again. And until then, I hope you have an absolutely beautiful rest of your day.